say the name? Oh, sorry, I thought you did. Are we ready? Are we ready? Oh, yeah. Well, you'll notice I'm not wearing my mask, uh, and I will let Justice Burdick know that's because I was having a very difficult time breathing, and nobody wanted to see me go backwards fainting well, on the stand today. My concern mm -hmm. in, in, in moving forward with a case of this magnitude is that visitation with, with my, my client, client through the public visiting room is not to prepare a defense. Visiting with my client through the phone system at the detention center is not adequate, does not allow uh, me to feel that in good faith I can have the conversation with my client. That said, I think given the COVID-19 mm -hmm. pandemic, Given the delay in the cases, given the history here of admissions of, of these recordings, whether intentional or not intentional, they have happened. Given uh, the, the statements here before the court that there are grounds to reduce the bond, the economic downturn has been extremely difficult on, on a lot of people. Uh, I mean, there, there's news out there every day about the increase in unemployment claims. Um, my client is no different. Uh, she was not employed going into this. Uh, she's not employed, obviously, during this time. Uh, her, sole, her sole access to employment or monetary fund is through her husband, uh, which is sell of books, and there's, a, I think, a general decline in the sell of books. A million dollars is the equivalent of holding the client without bail because there is no way that we're going to be able to meet, and we have tried, meet that requirement or meet that number. Um, what we're thinking is in the ballpark of $100,000 to $250,000, I think that puts enough skin in the game for the court that the court can feel good about her uh, ability or her desire to show up to court. I, I, I think that is realistic given the economic downturn, given her financial situation. The alternative to that is if the bail is ultimately unobtainable and a million dollars is. I, I, I've represented the court that anything above 500000 is, is, in my opinion, unobtainable, absent. Uh, a drastic change um, that we get into a situation of now we're going to have to have a customly designed communication process with my client that uh, we do not want to have any kind of access from the state or the detention center so that these type of issues don't come in the, pa in, in the future because I don't want an issue later on down the road after we go through this and accidental additional recordings, whether they're deleted or keep or however it happened, happen again. I, I think lowering the bond it, to a point saves the state. Uh, it doesn't allow, again, whether it's intentional or unintentional, for a recording like this to happen where we have to have another hearing like this. And at the same time, it puts my client in a position where she can better help me in the defense of this case and put some skin in the game as far as the bond amount here. We would ask that the court stick with their amended bond order that they issued. Uh, not too long ago. The one thing that we would ask in addition to that is other than the restriction of the four counties, that if the court feels that it's proper, that my client be allowed to travel to Ada County where my office is in Meridian and we can, that, that obviously that address is public knowledge and it's on the pleadings. 
uh, the amount of resources that can be saved in order to allow that to happen. And given that I represent her husband, Chad Daybell, in the event that there's an issue there, uh, would go really well. And if the court wanted to put a time limit on that, like a 24 hour travel back and forth, maybe a notice to the prosecutor, uh, maybe a limitation to uh, within two miles of the interstate between here and there so that you can get gas and whatnot. That's the only thing that we'd ask as far as amending the, uh, the bond release order, Your Honor. All right. Nothing else. Um, so I, I'm trying to be clear the basis on which I make my decision. I have your affidavit. And you have the affidavits of Mr. or er, Lieutenant Ball and Lieutenant Wilmore, which you've objected to being considered. Um, <coughs> and you've made allegations that Mr. Wood admitted to you that a number of other phone calls uh, had been recorded inappropriately. He's denying that. Um, with the exception of what he said, which was that a secretary in the office recognized your name after you came in and um, and Mr. Wood told her to block that call, I think, and told the jail to block your number. Um, so let me be clear because your gut reaction is not something I can take action on. It's not something I can recognize. What besides your, as you said, gut reaction that phone calls are being recorded, what else do I have that I can properly rely on? Well, I, I, I think that's where I mentioned in the court you have the, um, the limitations that are placed upon my client and the communication given the COVID-19 process or the COVID procedure over the detention center that makes it next to impractical or impossible for me to work with my client uh, in a way to prepare her defense. If I can describe you, I don't know, Judge, you're not, you're from Bonneville County. Uh, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to visit the public visiting room here in Madison. I, I no, but I think we're beyond talking about the public visiting room. So what, I'm trying to I'm trying really to nail down the phone calls and exactly what's being alleged so that I can weigh it against you. Sure, sure. I, I, so what I'm saying is how many phone calls and when are you alleging were recorded <coughs> before you filed your first motion? I, I am comfortable in representing to the court that there were at least three to four already that we know about and we do not have the discovery responses to our discovery and our subpoena. And that's again kind of a unique situation that we're in on this hearing uh, because the prosecution has supposedly has access to these things and they're able to put them in an affidavit and file them with the court. We don't have the responses. And so if I, we. I mean, I'm, and I'm complaining about what the other side did or didn't do. It's not very helpful when I'm trying to rely on facts. I mean, well, I, I, uh, there's a lot of things I could say each of you I wish would have done, sure. but. I don't get to choose that. So I need to focus on what's in front of me. Sure. What, what I can represent to the court is it was relayed to me that there were phone calls after the detention, uh, the motion for bond originally March 6. How many? They didn't say. Then we have... The and did they tell you that they were blocking them and that they had given your phone number to the jail? They said they would in the future. My conversations prior to that, because me being an out-of-town attorney, I have to have phone contact with my client. Prior to that disclosure, I had had the contact with various deputies ensuring that my phone calls weren't going to be recorded. This was not a new thing come March 9th or 10th. This was way back in around the whenever she was taken into custody over here is when the phone calls started. I had conversations and I asked, are they recorded? Is this confidential? Yes, it is. No, they're not recorded. You're fine. So when I was told that they were recorded, I was obviously taken back. Uh, and, and the representation to me was it was plural. Now, again, we have our discovery, we have our subpoena. I can better answer those questions when we get those responses. We don't have them as of yet. And your affidavit, you say that you did hear that they were being recorded on at least one of those dates at the end of March. You heard, you heard that, saying well, they were I, being I monitored and recorded. I didn't hear that they were recorded. In fact, if you go back and you look at the affidavit of Lieutenant Wilmore, he, he himself says, I believe it's, it's, it's paragraph 22 or, or 23, one of those twos. 
He says he turns off the recording on the 30th for a 24 hour period. And it was strange that it was recorded on the 31st. So as I sit here today, unable to exactly articulate how it happened, the person that is in charge of these recordings that operates this process is doing the same thing in an affidavit filed with the court yesterday. And so I'm trying to articulate to the court that this is what I know. Multiple recordings after the bond hearing and a mission of one recording that on the 7th by the prosecution that was allegedly accidentally recorded and then deleted. And then of course we learned later on yesterday that there were phone calls to if that if that's it is what we learned from the affidavit and I really you may that speculate with about sure. others but what we learned from the affidavits is that there were two sure. phone calls and, and I, I think the issue that, that I have is, is there's got to be a little bit of speculation allowed given the history of what's happening because the the multiple recordings that were disclosed before there were no statements of how many who had them when they were deleted how they happened these type of things I'm left to wonder how did this happen you it's don't really want the court to operate no. on speculation. No, 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 case, I, no, no, I don't, Your Honor. But the boy, point being, when I read that paragraph, obviously we talked about the differences in determining phone calls. Uh, he references to with the records that they submitted, but much like in his affidavit and the other affidavits, they're referencing statements from other individuals, corporals and sergeants and detectives that they don't file affidavits with, which I think is ironic somewhat, that these people were involved in important conversations and they're not presented. That's an issue. I okay. don't... I've heard that. I understand that part. I'm looking at your paragraph five of your affidavit or declaration as you come where it says, I was given the sole op option of communicating with my client in the public visitor meeting room, wall of glass between attorney and client over a recorded telephone line upon which my client was required to enter her inmate number for charges <coughs> and consent to recording of said phone call. Yes. The reason the reason this is important for me to distinguish is because is your argument that because she's in jail and her phone calls are recorded at any point in time makes it impossible for you to communicate with her or is your argument that the jail is surreptitiously recording attorney client conversations to use against you later I don't think I, I don't think I'd be comfortable closing the door on either one of those right now Right. Pending discovery and the subpoena. I, I, I want to argue the first, but I don't want to close the door on the second. Thank you. You're, thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> you referenced Article 6 of the Constitution. Can you point out to me which point there you wanted me to take note of? I believe that was the, um, the right to effective and assistant counsel. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not seeing that in Article 6. No, I'm sorry, I've got a lot of dates and things going through my head here. There's no question, certainly, that she has right to assistance of counsel. I just read Article 6, and I wasn't clear on that point which one you wanted me to take. Well, I'm having access with the Internet to, to – I don't have the uh, uh, Constitution memorized, Your Honor, and I don't want to misrepresent to the court. Um, if it's okay with you, may, may I approach? Constitution here. May I approach, Your Honor? And, well, that's all right. Yeah. I think you mean Amendment 6. Correct, Your Honor. Sixth Amendment to the United States Constitution, not Article 6. Correct, Your Honor. All right.
All right, give me just a minute. I'm looking through through my notes. All right. First of all, the court is always concerned with the constitutional rights of any defendant or other party that appears before it um, in court. It's of utmost importance to the court, which is why I do have a constitution that I carry with me and know and understand. Ms. Val, Ms. Daybell is. Um, afforded many rights in a criminal state in a criminal uh, case under both the US and the Idaho constitutions specifically in this hearing the due process rights under amendment 5 of the US Constitution and the right to bail under the 8th amendment to the United States Constitution and in my view, both of those rights have been afforded to her in this, in this matter so far. I will note that it's been maybe two months since the last bond hearing in this matter. And this is the second bond hearing. It is in front of a different judge and I noted right at the beginning of this hearing that I was not going to revisit Judge Eden's decision. I thought it was a sound decision. I have reviewed it and his reasons for that decision. And also because Mr. Means did not ask me to review in total Judge Eden's decision. And I have to prepare for this hearing as I do for any other based on the motions and the affidavits that are before me. And in Mr. Means motion, he alleged that there were new facts that had come to light and on that basis asked for a new, a new bail hearing, which was all very appropriate. Um, <coughs> if he had not made any allegations that things had changed in some way, then I would not have granted him a hearing. I would have just denied the motion. But because he did allege new facts, uh, we did have a hearing on the matter. I turn then to the support, well the standard um, as I noted before is good cause because I'm not revisiting the entire bail decision that Judge Eddins made, then the standard is under Idaho Criminal Rule 46 L2 of good cause for reason to uh, reduce bail in this matter, which is what I'm being asked to do. I'm being asked to reduce it um, to the range of 100 to, I did you say 150 or 250? 250, yeah. To between 100 and 250 thousand dollars, and so that is the standard that I'm applying. I'm looking for good cause to reduce the bond, and to change it from Judge Eden's decision to lower bond from five million dollars to one million dollars. The evidence that I have to support Mr. Means' argument essentially is paragraph five. In paragraph five of his declaration in support of his amended motion for bond reduction, he lays out his um, complaint against the jail recording the phone calls. And the implication is that, he, that paragraph five relates to March 30th. And I will note that by that time we were under the governor's order, Governor Little's order 
uh, stay-at-home order for Idaho. I'm not sure what date that happened. It seemed like lifetimes ago, but um, I know it was before March 30th. Uh, that's not referenced in the affidavit, but I do think it's a, a point of reference for all of us here. And so as I look at paragraph five, of course, I've pointed out that Mr. Means says that that conversation did say that it was being recorded and he recognized that. In addition to that, um, he states that he was also told prior to that of conversations that the prosecutor's office had heard. And based on what Mr. Wood said, it does appear that some of that happened. Um, it is beyond the evidence that I have before me today to know whether the warning was on those telephone calls or not. Neither uh, Mr. Means nor Mr. Wood state that, that those warnings were given. So I don't know that. Um, and then I'm left with Mr. Means' argument that he speculates and his gut tells him that he's being recorded in his phone calls between him and uh, Ms. Daybell. And of course, that is not something that I can act on, nor would Ms. Daybell want me to act on speculation or on gut responses. We have courts of law because we have to act on the only the evidence that's in front of us. Um, and that is, that is a task that I take very seriously. And that frankly, I think I'm very capable of discerning the difference between argument and evidence, as I have frequently told attorneys in my courtroom before. I know the difference between um, somebody throwing out allegations or, or making accusations one way or another and understanding that there is no evidence to support those. So I'm well aware of that difference. And then I also have the uh, Madison County Lieutenant's affidavits that were filed, <coughs> and I understand Mr. Means' objections to those because of the late filing, um, but I will also say that I don't see any real inconsistencies between those jail affidavits and what Mr. Means stated. Um, they expanded on Mr. Means' allegations, uh, but I I don't really see any inconsistencies. I know there have been some allegations between Mr. Means and Mr. Wood. None of those, I think, can be, um, I think all, I guess what I should say is all of those can be explained uh, by reference to both affidavits. I don't think that the allegations they're making towards each other are necessarily inconsistent. I think that they're consistent, just one, uh, Mr. Means' allegations are broader, Mr. Wood's are more specific, um, and so I don't see a huge amount of inconsistency between the affidavits. I've heard nothing to indicate to me that Ms. Daybell is being treated differently than anyone else at Bonneville County Jail. I do recognize the difficulty that the jails are operating under. I am very aware of how that may impact the constitutional rights of defendants, and that is something that I can tell you all the judges in the state are very aware of. Um, but in this case, I really don't see an impact on Ms. Daybell's constitutional rights with the jail process. The sheer volume of the evidence that needs to be uh, digested by Ms. Daybell and her attorney does make it difficult with her being in jail, but there are other people in jail right now that have defenses that they need to go through with their attorney, certainly none with the volume of this one, I'm sure. but. Uh, they are still there. There was not any bulk release of defendants from incarceration at Madison County Jail because of the virus. And so I'm confident that that can be worked around. I would certainly invite uh, 
evidence that conversations are being inappropriately recorded between counsel and client of, of any sort, whether it's Ms. Daybell or anyone else, um, to be brought to the court's attention. I'm not sure a motion to reduce bond is exactly the, the way to do that, but certainly uh, we don't want that happening, and I'm confident that the jail will make sure that that doesn't happen. I happen to believe that Mr. Wood and, and Madison County Sheriff's Office have great motivation to make sure they don't do that in this case or any other because it is a serious <coughs> violation of constitutional rights. Um, and if it actually has occurred, as Mr. Means speculates that it might, and by, and I guess what I should say when I say that if, that if it's actually occurring, what I mean is if conversations between an attorney and client without a warning that they're being recorded are actually being recorded, then that would certainly be something that I would want to know about. But I don't really have any evidence that that is actually what is going on here. Um, so on that basis, I'm denying the motion for bond reduction because I cannot find any good cause um, to reduce bond further than it already has. And I would invite Mr. Means to consult with local defense attorneys who I'm sure have come up with alternatives during this time and then also have a long track record of dealing with Madison County Jail. I'm aware that different jails can have very different procedures and I'm confident that there are a number of defense counsel in Madison County that would be willing to talk to Mr. Means about ways to surmount any virus problems at the jail um, in regards to communicating with clients. Do you have any questions for me, Mr. Means? I, I do, Your Honor. You, you referenced, um, you made the statement, your confidence you can work around, you know, the, the limitations with the COVID-19 issue in communication with my client. Uh, I've had some ideas on that, and I think it would probably help uh, Mr. Wood and I to get some input from you if you're comfortable in giving us some suggestions. I could, I could possibly make some suggestions to you. You could tell me if those are unrealistic or realistic in your eyes or something that we should consider. It would help us in probably coming to an agreement on how to make that happen. I uh, never made quarters sure. for the jail because I don't know their procedures well enough. So. Um, if the two of you want to talk to me about that and any problems that still persist, which I also haven't heard anything about, um, but if you want to bring that to me, that's fine. But I always make sure I include the jail in that yes. because what I, what I know is that what I see from this side of the bench and my understanding from this side of the bench of what the jail does is not always consistent yeah. with what they are actually doing in practice. And, and I only have a small piece of understanding of what they're actually doing. There's a lot to running a jail that I don't get involved in. Sure. I, I guess what I'm trying to avoid is in the event that we can't come to an agreement on how to allow communication between the two of us, I don't want to get in a situation where a motion has to be filed and it's pushed out and it's pushed out and pushed out because of what we're dealing with uh, just because of what we've already dealt with in the future. So again, if you had any suggestions, I'm open to this. I've got a few suggestions, but again, I can talk to Rob, see if we can come to an agreement. If not, it's probably something that we'd have to bring back to you at some point in time to get some kind of direction or order. And I guess if you did bring such motion, I would want it very specific as to right. what you would like the jail to do because that's the only way they can really respond. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a great problem solver. I will say so myself. But I can't do it if I don't have the appropriate data and I do not have the appropriate information about Madison County Jail um, to make any sort of decision about how things should go. 
Sure. So if any such motion is brought to me, I'd appreciate if it was after you had already attempted to work with them and with specific ideas about what you wanted to do. Would that be a motion that you would consider that <coughs> if there's not a request for an oral argument that, that Rob and I, again, if we can't come to an agreement, which I think we can, that we could submit to you and then you could issue an order on your own without an oral argument? I'm always open to that. I appreciate if you let me know that's what you'd sure. like to do. Sure. And if you'd like to file that under seal, that's fine too, because I know you may not want everyone to know exactly how you're communicating with your client. That may not be the extent of detail that you want everyone in the world to know. Right. So you can go ahead and file that under seal on a, with a separate motion. Okay. Um, so if you'd like to do that, uh, you can do it that way but otherwise it, it's hard for me to rule if I don't have specific information. No, that, that, that makes a lot of sense because we would obviously want some protections if some kind of electronic devices were provided to my client that aren't going to be subject to any kind of subpoena or forensic examination at a later time. Those are things that obviously we would want to discuss ahead of time. All right. Thank you. Anything, any questions Mr. Wood about my decision? No, Your Honor. Can you prepare the order for me Mr. Wood? Yes. And when do you think you can have that for me? Uh, Wait, does Monday morning suffice? Uh, yeah, Monday by five is fine. Your Honor, would you be open to the idea that if I get a, a, an opportunity to see the order and sign off as far as the stipulation prior to it being signed by the court? That's fine. Okay. Um, and if there's any problems with that, because of problems with counsel connecting, what I usually do is just ask the person preparing the order to submit that to me with a letter saying I wasn't able to get counsel to use the order. All right, um, I uh, appreciate your arguments and we will be in recess. Thank you. All right.